The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in Romans chapter eight, and uh, we are got a few points to wrap up uh, the summary of the verses that we've been looking at. So uh, page 13 of your notes, and then we will move on to the notes you should have picked up. God has provided for the believer in Jesus Christ a rapid and grace way to restore fellowship at any time, under any circumstance. Uh, this is your opportunity to start off on the right foot, so to speak, in fellowship. Uh, hopefully you're already there. Uh, but anyway, get yourself in fellowship, keep yourself in fellowship, and make up your mind that uh, you're going to take this seriously because this is God's word by which he evaluates all humanity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, since man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from your mouth, we've so assembled ourselves together as one body in Christ so that we can continue to advance spiritually under the banner of divine viewpoint to the end. Thank you for everything you provide us with in the midst of all of our trials and tribulations. Be with us in our study that we may be encouraged to apply Bible doctrine in the face of the opposition that we are up against. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Romans 8. <clears throat> I'm going, to read the, I'm going to read the entire block of verses uh, and wrap up the uh, uh, these analysis uh, with the concept of that Christians suffer. First of all, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. God the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the gospel. He is the one who makes divine viewpoint clear to positive volition. And he leads believers. Non-unbelievers are not led by the Spirit. As I noted in the analysis, everybody who is a believer has been led by the Holy Spirit at least once. <clears throat> but those who follow up and proceed uh, as the Holy Spirit is our guide to lead us into all truth and to reveal to us things to come. That is his assignment among the members of the Godhead. It's important that everybody understands that clearly. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, inspired to human authors of the Bible, superintended their writing of this down, so that there would be not one word of inaccuracy. Retaining the individual personalities, keeping the individual personalities of the human authors intact, other than places where it is straight dictation. The Holy Spirit then, for the individual who responds to the good news of eternal salvation, the Holy Spirit regenerates that person, indwells that person, gives the person at least one spiritual gift, which you discover down the road, and keeps you sealed and will be involved in your resurrection. So the Holy Spirit plays a very distinctive and important role within the Godhead. You came here today because you were led by the Spirit. 
the Spirit didn't lead you to stay home or whatever else people do, unless, of course, it's beyond your control. We understand that. The Holy Spirit leads you to face-to-face -face teaching. <clears throat> For all who are being, and he leads you with regard to when you walk out of here today, he leads you to make application of Bible doctrine as it is before you. So that's being led by the Spirit. These then are the sons of God. Sons of God, and this is important, though I've mentioned it numerous times, that all of us who are believers are a part of a family, God's family. Our Heavenly Father, that's our Father. Jesus Christ made it possible for us to enter into this family. And the Holy Spirit incorporated us into this family. We are a part of a family of believers through time. For you have not received a spirit of slavery or enslavement, leading to fear again. With salvation and the enlightenment that is associated with that, we are no longer slaves to fear, fear of death primarily but not only. Fear of death. We are not to fear death. Death is just an exit point from this life to a far better one. So we are not to, we are not under the fear factor as believers, nor should we be, that we were under before we got saved. We went about our lives under fear of the unknown, of death. Death is the last enemy, not Satan, death. Death is the last enemy and it will be defeated. And so we have not received that type of a spirit. The Holy Spirit does not lead us into fear we live in a time when we could be afraid of a lot of things, worry about a lot of things. Try to discipline yourself not to live under the fear of whatever that's out there. We have the scripture, we have the assurance that Jesus Christ controls history. You might not like the way things are, neither do I. They suck, so much of it. And it just get, seems to get worse as we move forward. But what do we expect in light of the day of the Lord coming and the necessity of that wrath that will be poured out on the nations? He's gonna bring an end to it, a dramatic end to it. But have received a spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption is we are the adopted children of God, not the natural children of God in the sense of a natural child in a natural family. We were on the outside looking in and we've been adopted. But it's just as powerful as natural birth. We're just as much a member of the family even though we were all adopted. Because prior to being saved, we were not children of God. We were children of the evil one. He was our father. When we, when we embraced Jesus Christ as savior, we broke from the dominion of the rule of Satan in that regard. Experientially, you can be run around by him and his viewpoint but you're no longer a part of that group. By which we cry out in time of trial and time of difficulty. We're gonna have a great verse coming up on this. One of my very favorite verses ever with regard to prayer, but we'll save it for then. You'll read ahead, you know which one it is. It's in this chapter. 
we have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is simply the language Jesus and his disciples spoke on earth was Aramaic. And Abba is the equivalent of our Papa, Daddy, so forth. So we cry out, Abba, Father, before the throne of grace, in times of difficulty and need. That's what you and I are supposed to do. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. He bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And nobody can take that away from us. No one can damage that, overturn that, negate it in any way whatsoever. We're in that family and we're in it forever. We are children of God. And if children, heirs also, let's take it up another notch. The other notch is we are heirs of God. We're going to inherit something. When people die, their children inherit their, what they leave behind. That's a common understanding of inheritance. Okay? So, we have inheritance coming. We have studied that in many places. <clears throat> and fellow heirs with Christ. Christ, Jesus Christ, as a result of his commitment and sacrifice at the first advent, and yet, and we looked at Isaiah 53, everything he went through from birth to death till he exited, everything he went through during his time on earth, God rewards him for his endurance in the face of opposition and all he went through, he rewards him by making him. Now, I'm talking about him as a man, as the heir of all things, all things. And that heirship of his, that's what it's called in Hebrews, he endured all he endured for the joy that was set before him. And the joy set before him is that same joy that is set before us, a resurrection body with SG3 and all that goes with it. I can't even begin to give it full justice. So, and it's forever, and it's eternal, and it's in a new creation. When none of the negatives that you and I experience will be around us. None of it. You can't name anything, a minor or major, that will afflict you and I when we are under full sanctification. And it's true also for those that are in heaven waiting. What are they waiting for? They have doctrine. They're waiting for their resurrection body. They want that. If there's one thing they don't have up there now, it's their resurrection body. And because that's what is taught in the Bible, they want what's theirs. That's perfectly natural. <clears throat> and if fellow heirs with Christ, but here's the important thing. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him, the pathway to big time inheritance is to endure your allotment of sufferings. And they aren't just happenstance. Oh, that bad happened to me. Oh, no, they're not accidental. You have an allotment of sufferings. I have an allotment of sufferings that we're asked to go through in phase two. If we do this under doctrine, then we are going to receive glorification in capital letters beyond just the average believer who doesn't 
line up and goes through and ends their life. Yes, they'll get the basic package. So to the extent that you are willing to endure and persevere, and sufferings come in all forms, from people, from circumstances, you name it. You're well aware of them. All right. Some things on suffering. <clears throat> uh, we, looked at, we looked at a few things. Uh, it's great to announce to you that you can convert your sufferings into SG3. There's SG3 where it's simple application. It may not be involving any suffering, just you make an application. You stepped up and put some money in the offering. You sang a song as unto the Lord. Uh, your normal everyday activities that you have to do to survive and get by, they're all rewardable. But we're dealing with basically suffering as a vehicle. Jesus Christ went through his allotment of sufferings and he included all those things. It's, it's almost shocking when you see it in that light when you read Isaiah 53. But the chapter ends with him being vindicated and raised up from all this and given, a, given this name and all the other factors that go with it. God has and is and will reward his son for his application in time so he would be qualified to bear the sins of the world, including even the ignominy of a Roman cross and all that that was done to him and how he handled every step of it. But you see, he already had the Old Testament scripture. He'd studied him through his life. He knew what was coming. He knew what the so-called bad was. He knew what his niche was. He wasn't going to be a well-to-do man living on the earth. Yet he's God who created it all. He did not succumb to the temptation to misuse his deity, to alleviate any problems he might have had. And then, of course, came the final conclusion, his arrest, abuse by people, nasty people, <clears throat> spitting in his face, no retaliation, blindfolding him and slapping his face and saying, if you're the Messiah, you know who just hit you. That kind of cheap stuff. The Romans with their mocking, with their uh, putting a reed in his hand and bowing down and what they did to him. So it was both Jews and Gentiles that abused him through this. The whole court scene was a travesty. Not legal. You don't do these things at night. You administer justice in a courtroom in the daytime. You remember the old stories about the uh, uh, taking people off in the night and trying them? That's one of the things that Amer America protested uh, that the British were doing. That's all illegal. So he went through all that. Didn't sin. He knew when to keep his mouth shut and not tit for tat, respond to some person's nasty comments. He worked his way through that. And then all the pain associated with scourging, crucifixion, uh, all of it. Even the, the one possession he had, I say one, the one possession he had, they took it and they tore it into three pieces. And it wasn't, it wasn't an ordinary garment. It was the kind of garment a rich person would wear. 
So it is by his poverty, his impoverishment, that we are made rich. And all we have to do, I say all, we have to do is stay positive, stay with the truth, through the good and the bad, through the difficult, watching people fall by the wayside. That's a part of our sufferings. It gives us lupe, sorrow. So, as noted, if we endure, that's the big if, if we endure, you will be tempted from time to time to throw in the towel, to blank with it. I'm not putting up with this anymore. That's a mistake. That is the big mistake you could make. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Your position in the kingdom of God will be directly related to the fact that you endured to the end. Not just endured for a number of years, even a number of decades. You endure to the end. I think I, I, I believe I've made it pretty clear to people that sat out here in what they might call happier times. What are you going to do if this happens to you? What are you going to do if uh, your loved ones, kids, grandkids, whatever, bail? What are you going to do? You going to join them? You're not willing to undergo that humiliation? That kind of suffering? Well, some of you have. Or even your spouse, who was once supportive and positive and all the rest, and flipped. What are you going to do? Well, go to the Bible and find out what these great believers did when they were up against a similar type of situation. What are you going to do when your health fails? What are you going to do? I'm not quite as mobile as I used to be. So you know who I remember? That real stout guy in his prime, physical prime, and not his spiritual prime, <laughs> in his physical prime, how he ended up. Hopefully you won't have to carry me up here. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, shame on you. So I remember him. You know, the Bible tells us, remember these people. So if you have a similar type of suffering that you're going through, you'll be able to take heart. The great, powerfully built, strong as an ox, Jacob. He got in a wrestling match with Yahweh. He didn't know it was Yahweh. He just wanted to uh, burn off some nervous energy because Esau was coming and he hadn't seen him for 20 years. And last time he saw him, Esau had blood in his eyes and wanted to kill his brother and would have, but in God's providence, Jacob's life has suddenly turned upside down. He doesn't have the comfort of home with Isaac and Rebekah. He has to put on a, we'd say today, a backpack and head north into Mesopotamia with the relatives while Esau is fuming and wanting to kill him. His life just got turned upside down. But that's what made him great. That's when he began to take stock of things and not be the STA case he was when he was at home. It made him grow up spiritually. And then he had Laban, <laughs> Uncle Laban, to deal with. 
and he put up with it and four wives for 20 years. Now, I'm not saying wives are bad. I'm just saying <laughs> had four of them. And then, then, then all these kids, boom, 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 boom. See? And so he's got to come back to the land. It's time to come back. He's behind him. He's got Laban coming after him. But God stops Laban in his tracks. He basically, paraphrasing, God told Laban, you can run your big mouth but you better not lift a finger towards Jacob. He got that message. And then he finds out that his brother Esau is coming with a small army of men. And he concludes the worst. They're out to wipe me out. It's these moments when believers have these, they drop the ball on the one yard line. Instead of clutching it like crazy. God didn't bring me back here to have that dummy wipe me out and shut down the whole Abrahamic covenant thing. Now did he? The covenant was reiterated to, him, to, to, to Isaac and him. They knew what it was. They weren't going to be wiped out. They're the chosen people. They're the vehicle through which eventually the Messiah would come on the scene. So they're not going to be wiped out. But you still have an STA, still get under fear. And he wrestles with Yahweh, who at first he just thought was a stranger. He's apparently, and that particular sport was pretty good. But as he wrestled and wrestled and wrestled, he realized this wasn't a stranger, a regular human. He figured it out. Sweaty and all, he figures it out. And then he has to deal with Esau. And Esau is all friendly. Oh, my brother is long. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he got a new life. He forgot about all that. And that's where he got his injury. It didn't, it didn't incapacitate him instantly. The sciatic nerve, that's what hit him. And it deteriorated over time until the man was confined to being carried around. How humbling is that? Being carried around on a pallet wherever he had to go because the pain of walking was, was, was out of the question. And when did he make one of his greatest, if not the greatest applications? It was when he was in that condition. When he got up off that pallet for the last time, we got up off that pallet and bowed before Joseph to fulfill the prophecy. Laid back down on the pallet and died. And he's commemorated for this in the Hall of Fame. Unusual things believers do. Circumstances that we, we just go through our Christian life when we're put in situations and we're expected to perform. There is grace to do this. This is where we shine. Now when we join the big crowd and run with them, it's when we do what we have to do, regardless of family or any other considerations. You've heard this before many times. Now at the end is time to do and keep doing what you're doing without wavering. Ask yourself the question. If so-and-so hadn't left, if so-and-so hadn't left, would I still be here? Yeah. Well, what's the difference? There's no difference. You had friends, I've had friends. We're seeing this through. We're going to see this through. All right. <clears throat> In this regard, if we endure, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. What? 
not salvation. I can imagine some of the people get a hold of these verses. Reward and that high regard and position. Huh? Well, it's a lot of what a lot of people want out there. Even in their little niche, they want to be up the up in the limelight, so to speak. All right. Uh, point 44, also note the promise of Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He provides a way of escape. For those, those not adjusted to the plan of God, that, that promise doesn't hold up. It holds up for the righteous, not just believers, but experientially righteous. He delivers them out of them all. And then the, the uh, so point 45, the sufferings of the body of Christ, the church, are viewed as filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I'm talking about his personal afflictions while on earth. Obviously, after that, there are no more afflictions for him of any kind. He's above all afflictions and suffering seated at the right hand of God the Father in that glorious throne room up there. So filling up, filling up the afflictions, you and I have at, at our part. And there's a certain, it's like filling a vessel up. Okay, we reach the top, it's full now. Last drop, boom, it's full. And when that's full, the rapture will occur. It'll also occur in connection with the last person of the church age who believes in Christ for salvation and completes the membership of the body of Christ, universal. So those are two things. Only God obviously knows what that is. 47, our sufferings for standing firm in the faith will be rewarded with future glory. We didn't deny him. We didn't deny the truth. We might have stumbled. We might have got caught up in something, but made a comeback. 1 Peter 4.13 But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. I know under affliction it's hard to be happy, but this is supernatural. Keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. That's at the rapture and the Bema seat where maximum celebration will take place. Very vocal, very, very overt on the part of those through the, through the church age who achieve the high reward. Hopefully we'll all be in that. God will never put you under more than you can endure. He might run you right up to the edge. <laughs> Job was run right up to the edge. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No testing. Right? The translation in the versions is temptation. Okay, temptation is a form of testing. But let's do testing and I'll do it with testing. No testing has overtaken you. But such is common to man. You didn't have something unique happen to you that no one ever experienced. So that's obvious. It's common human problems. From the charge of the mosquito to the charge of the elephant and everything in between. God will give you the inner strength. If you bear down on it, when you're under big testing, he'll give you inner strength to ride on through it. You might, you'll even be amazed that you have this inner strength and even peace when you're under a real big test. If you start, again, everything goes back to thinking right. Thinking right doctrinally. Is God in control in this now? Don't act like he isn't and run around like a chicken with your head cut off. God's in control. You can have concern and you have prayer in the face of some threat 
of some sort to you or a loved one. It has overtaken you as such is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able. But with the testing, will provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. And of course, we looked at the, pre the previous verse, which said, basically, uh, uh, we looked at another verse, which said that in every test you're under, he gives you also at the same time comfort. You know, people comfort people when they're under the gun. Do they not? People in the world do. We as believers should do that with other fellow believers. And we can encourage one another. So God has promised to provide us with this insulation, this help when we're under a test and he encourages our human spirit, he encourages us within, it buoys us up, but we're still under the test. And maybe something else has to happen to further encourage us. will provide the way of escape so you'll be able to endure it. How are we to handle opposition? For what credit is there, there's a context for this, for what credit is there if you sin and are harshly treated? You endure it with patience, but if when you do right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. You may come under the gun in an environment. It may, be, it may be in your workplace where you're being not treated right, for instance. And if you act up, then, but if you endure it, bear up under unfairness and things like that, if it should occur, handling it completely different than the way people would handle stuff, this finds favor with God. Uh, there is SG3 connected to just growing old. You don't have to do anything. Just get older. Just hit the senior citizen barrier. Crack it. And that, of course, is nice to know. 2 Corinthians 4. I'm telling myself a lot of times, I, I, I talk to myself. Now, Jack, get yourself in fellowship. Have the right mental attitude about this adversity you're under. And while you're in fellowship, you're, 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 you're generating SG3. And don't say to me, I have enough SG3. You never can get enough. You may have a lot. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. That means to be demoralized. But though our outer man is decaying. Now, young people, they don't think about that at all. I mean, they look around and see people that are old. They're having trouble walking or something. They can't even imagine that they'd ever be in that situation. That's just for those people. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That's uh, primarily related to the intake of Bible doctrine. It's a renewal process. For a momentary light affliction, imagine someone under various, uh, uh, very, excuse me, very serious health testing. You know, very serious. And, it, and, and you want to describe this, it's momentary. It's not going to last for, you know. And it's light affliction. Light affliction. Even though we would, we would say they're under a real big test. Real big test. It's light affliction. Because of the doctrine within us and our understanding 
of what follows is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Something really heavy in a good way. Far beyond all comparison. Compare it to anything you want to compare it to down here. Things you might like that trip your trigger. Beautiful, wonderful, expensive automobiles. Some people have garages full of these darn things because they're rich people. They collect them. They only drive one at, one at a time. Or whatever it is. A yacht. A home here, here, here a private jet, a chef, on and on it goes, right? Well, this is far beyond all comparison. The uh, Italian family, the Medicis, the Medicis, probably mispronounced it. Anyway, doesn't matter, of yesteryear. Their homes are still standing. And people who have visited them marvel at the gardens and all that was in these homes. They had all this unbelievable wealth. And they, and, and, and they, and they were tasteful with it. They were smart with it. They built these homes that are still standing and in good shape and people go in and see the marvel at the different rooms and places within this, this Italian family. Well, it's far beyond all comparison. While we look at the things, while we look not, excuse me, left out, while we look, now what's this supposed to mean? While we look not at the things which are seen, we don't close our eyes. We inevitably see stuff. It's that it doesn't lead to, I got to have that. Uh, I want this and this and this at all costs, but at the things which are not seen. That's why we will sacrifice the things which are seen if necessary so that we can stay on track for the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Always keep that in mind. Temporal, even though some item may be in a museum and be thousands of years old, in fact, as far as the person who owned it, it's temporal. It's ripped out of their hands when they die. It's temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. All right, let's take our break. Coffee break. Fellowship break. What do we want to call it?